So why are we here today? Why did uh, Mary and I spend so much time looking through so many research reports trying to really understand and have been doing for years trying to understand uh, what's happening within our sector? And, and really there have been recent headlines that kind of made us all sit up in our chair, which was particularly the, the Chronicle of Philanthropy uh, and AFP conducting research with the Harris Poll that came out with this headline. And many of you have seen this headline, right? 51% of fundraisers plan to leave their jobs by 2021, says new survey. This was enough of a wake up call for us at MarketSmart and for Mary as well to say, okay, we want to we want to dig into this because that seems high. And there, there might be a, you know, a lot of insight into digging into the research to understand why this headline exists. So instead of brushing it under the rug, we wanted to have a candid conversation. And Mary brings a wealth of experience and a lot of her previous writings have uh, you know, garnered a lot of engagement around this topic. Uh, and I'm here to bring my two cents, my opinion, my, my uh, uh, background from, from MarketSmart as to what we've seen and, and why the uh, research is suggesting what it's suggesting. So Mary, I guess I'll let you introduce yourself. Sure, hi everyone. I'm Mary Kalan, that rhymes with Salon, if you ever wondered, most people do. Um, though I will answer to anything even vaguely close to it that's been <laughs> trained into me since first grade. Um, I am now a fundraising consultant focusing on copywriting and usually annual giving programs. Um, but that comes after 30 years of professional experience as a staff member. So all the what we're going to talk about today sounds very familiar. I, I've been there, done that. Yes, and you're going to bring uh, an angle and, and an area of expertise that unfortunately I can't touch on, uh, but is incredibly valuable for our conversation. Uh, my name, my voice is Zach Shefska. I'm Chief Operating Officer at Market Smart. Uh, we work primarily with uh, organizations to help build out their major and, and legacy giving programs. Um, and in my experience, uh, overseeing a team, uh, supporting a team, and then also being very analytical. So I've worked on different uh, benchmark studies that we've produced uh, and really in the data. And that's the angle that you know I'll really speak to is trying to understand what this research is telling us and also what are the implications uh, for our organizations. Okay, so that's kind of the, the, the background on Mary and myself. And here's what we're gonna try and address today. It, it, we've got a lot of slides, we've got a lot of talking points, and we've got a lot to cover, but here's what we hope to, uh, you know, to, to, to share with you. First is a, a high level overview of that Chronicle Philanthropy AFP Harris Poll survey. So there were a lot of really interesting takeaways and a lot of interesting stats. Mary's really going to lead the charge there and walk us through what we found in that research. Then we're going to transition the conversation to how we actually calculate and can think about the true cost of fundraiser turnover. What were the bright spots from this most recent piece of research? So what, what can we actually take away that isn't in a negative light, but more in a positive light? And then finally, wrapping things up with tactics and actionable things that we can do back in our offices to try and mitigate this concern of having you know, our team not necessarily stick with us for the long haul. Before we jump into the uh, you know, findings from the, the AFP Chronicle Harris research, just want to put on your radar here, whoops, put on your radar here, the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics calculate separation rates by industry. And this table that's on your screen is pretty overwhelming. And that's why we've kind of simplified it here with this report, this chart. The point being is separation rates and turnover essentially happen across every sector uh, in any organization. It's trying to understand where that, that measures out relative to what we think it should be and also our peers. So for example, here you can see we, we've selected four. You've got retail, professional and business services, and then you've got arts, entertainment, and recreation. A huge number of individuals <laughs> turn over in that space. Mary, do you have any personal experience with that? <laughs> <laughs> I, I broke all the trends in my years in the arts. <laughs> I was the one who stubbornly stuck around. <laughs> 
I mean, I know I can speak to personal experience from retail and, and I can understand why that's where it is. Yes. But then, of course, you see um, government. So people that end up working for the federal government or local governments, there's really low turnover. Although when you think about it, 20 percent turnover still seems high, but obviously relative to its peers, it's not. So this leads us to why fundraisers leave. So Mary, I'll, I'll, I'll kind of hand off to you here. Sure, um, sure. Yeah. So big reason, um, and I'm sure all of this will resonate with you, high pressure, low appreciation. Uh, fundraisers are expected to be miracle workers. I can remember walking into a new job, a new organization, and having the ED say, oh, thank goodness you're here, we need money doesn't work that way. And that's a scary load to have put on your shoulders. Not only scary, but it seems, you know, uh, unrealistic as well. And, and then it puts this pressure on you that obviously uh, you're speaking to. Totally unrealistic. Totally. Um, the pressure is often matched with not a whole lot of appreciation. So the organization might be in bad shape and they need money and you work 300 hours a day trying to find ways to fill that gap and it's just expected that you don't get a whole lot of appreciation for that hard work and often i think the reason people are not promoted as much as they would like are twofold one most nonprofits are very small so there just isn't room to grow uh you need to wait for someone to leave before you can take their job or you are the only fundraiser. The other, and raise your hand if you've had this experience, is being passed over for a promotion internally because everyone's interested in someone from outside. <laughs> Somehow being outside the organization makes you much more attractive than having been there and working hard for that. I've had that happen multiple times. I'm sure you have too. And I wish I knew why that happened. It also happens with consultants, right? Where you know as a consultant, they're going to listen to what you have to say, even though what you have to say is exactly what the staff person has already <laughs> said. Sometimes it's, uh, I guess, when you have the uh, financial burden of paying for the privilege of someone telling you what to do, you start to listen. And there's even the anecdote or the, or the saying, you know, you want to raise, we'll go get a different job. You know, like that's... Yes. And, and it's unfortunate, and the data here backs that just as well. I mean, you can see on the screen. Right, right, well, which less perfect. valued once they know you well, which makes no sense, but it seems to be the way it works. And I feel like this is an important point, Mary, just to, to mention to the audience. You know, this study and survey that the Chronicle AFP uh, sponsored and Harris Poll uh, conducted, there were over a thousand respondents, uh, frontline fundraisers. So, I mean, this is not trivial. This is not we polled, you know, individuals from 20 you know subset organizations i mean this is how this is a pulse on our sector essentially and obviously you speak to it from from your personal experiences and then it's even cross sector this concept of you know not necessarily having um, opportunities for promotion like i see it all the time so even with my peers and it's so challenging because it leads to this high pressure low appreciation environment yep totally absolutely so Another big problem is that fundraisers understand fundraising, but the people who are setting expectations for your success don't necessarily understand fundraising. And it's, it's not a bad thing not to understand necessarily, but goals and metrics, all of that should be set by the expert, which is the fundraiser. Um, so this sets up a weird tension where you're kind of got two jobs. Do the fundraising, and teach everyone what fundraising is. Supporters and those relationships, that's what fundraising is about, right? Relationships internally, relationships externally, donors, funders, foundations, government, all of that, and that's your job. But somehow we don't feel like we have enough time to do that really critical part of the job. There's too much busy work going on and not enough of the real, the real reason for fundraising. And Mary, would you say, and, and, and maybe speak to your experience, you know, if you have to spend time justifying what you're doing, and then also I would even lob into this category from my vantage point, leveraging 
tools and systems that might not be the most efficient? Do you think Absolutely. those are some of the drivers that take away from being able to go meet with supporters? Being Absolutely. Able to- Absolutely. Also, also management that um, feels like hours put in is a good measure of the work you're doing rather than goals that you've set up together and you're meeting. Um, FaceTime is an Apple app. It is not a good metric of success or effectiveness. <laughs> um, people who fundraise need to be out and about. And sometimes you won't see them for quite a while. But if you have good, good expectations that you've made together, you'll be able to measure their success. I wonder, and, and I see this in the, in the for-profit space, both... Um, you know, we try and buck this trend with our team at MarketSmart, um, but my peers as well, is this concept of availability. Yes. So from, and I, I hate using the M word, using management, but from a management perspective, there's almost this expectation that you should be available between, I was going to say nine to five, but we all know there's that expectation. Oh, right. Eight to eight. Eight to eight. Um, but you- Constant. You can't if you're being an effective fundraiser, right? I mean, you, just like you said, you're, you're meeting with people, you're building rapport and relationships. Right. If I'm meeting with a donor and the boss calls through, the boss is going to wait, right? And that's as it should be. And I think that's one of the big takeaways from the research is that in 78% of shops, that's not the reality. You right. know, the availability of being at a desk and being seen. Yes. Take precedence over, um, you know, having that appointment or being out on the road. Although I know, and you know this from uh, uh, some slides that we'll get to in a little bit from, from diving deeper into the research, there's kind of an interesting juxtaposition here with some of the bright spots. So it is interesting to think about, you know, being in that staff person role and, and what the, the stressors and also kind of the positives are. Uh, but I won't foreshadow too terribly. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> So deadlines and timelines, um, the ED or the chief financial officer comes in and says, ah, we have a budget shortfall and I can't make payroll next week. Have you ever had that can't make payroll problem dumped on your shoulders? It's terrifying and it's not the way building a good fundraising program works. It takes time to do this right. And the key is once you've done it right, then you will be very successful. And if you continue doing it right, you will continue to succeed. And those budget problems will be less dire. But you can't drop everything and find enough money to make payroll next week and still be focused on the real goal, which is a strong program. And then putting all that weight on one person's shoulders, huh? Yes, (laughs) right? Right. I mean, again, most nonprofits are small, so there may be one person in the organization who is the fundraiser. Way too often that person is either supposed to be a part time person. Uh, tell me how well that works. I've, I've found that doesn't work at all. Um, or, or they're doing fundraising and um, fundraising involves all kinds of different disciplines. Uh, someone who will make a fantastic major gifts officer maybe isn't great at putting together an event. Someone who's a grant writer probably wouldn't feel comfortable going out and being a major gifts person. They're different personalities, they're different skills. Fundraising involves lots of them. And one person can't really be expected to do them all excellently. And I wonder, Mary, to to that point where you you have strengths and weaknesses in your, your skills, but then maybe you have other people who aren't uh, specifically working on fundraising, but those in leadership positions who say, yeah, no, we need to put on that event. We need to do this. That's how we're going to raise the funds. And they set those unreasonable expectations and also then dictate how to do things. Yes, yes. Well, the board wants to do an event. <laughs> do you know how long it takes to put together a good event? <laughs> it's crazy and how little money it actually usually raises. And, you know, it, may, it may bring in some money now, but events are not the answer to every fundraising problem. And in that moment to respond and say, well, I would really like it if the board all donated to, <laughs> to us, you know, like there's a fun line. You're going to fill yourself. Yeah. 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 And I think this, this parlays into really nicely, you know, another piece of research that's very compelling. And this was a 2013 uh, research project, um, 
called Underdeveloped. Um, there was a, a foundation and then um, a research organization that conducted this. And essentially what they wanted to look at was trying to understand uh, expectations and what impact they had on performance. So essentially they, they came up with, with this chart here that you're seeing on your screen. And I just thought this was fascinating, right? When we think about expectations and who's involved in setting them. So the way that you can interpret this is you can see uh, over here, let me, I'll use my mouse. Organization has realistic financial goals in place. So high performing organizations uh, have uh, realistic financial goals in place, makes sense less organizations uh, that, that uh, don't have realistic financial goals in place they <laughs> perform as well. Makes sense, right? But then when you think about how involved the person who's in charge of fundraising is in setting those, that's where you see a bigger impact is when we have people within the organization that maybe dictate what the expectation should be, mm -hmm. we don't perform as well. However, when we're involved in that process of, of goal setting essentially, uh, we do perform better. I don't know, Mary, have, have you ever in your career, both as a consultant and as, as uh, within an organization, have you seen or experienced that? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, on both ends, when the development director and, and the ED or, or CEO work in partnership to develop goals, then those end up being much more realistic. And that means you can budget well and plan well. When they're not, you get pie in the sky. Well, we need to raise, you know, $1 million. I had a board member years ago suggest that the solution to the organization's budget problems was to ask Steven Spielberg for money because he likes the arts. <laughs> sure, that's going to do it. <laughs> um, we'll or, that again, so. <laughs> <right>. <laughs> Just call him, no problem. <laughs> uh, or or the, the other side are, um, either program staff or an ED who keeps coming up with great new programs, but hasn't spoken to the fundraiser about how these, how or if these new programs could be funded. Um, realistic goals, you need, you need the fundraiser in that conversation. And I will just jump in, Eric, um, thanks for asking, underdeveloped, yes, uh, this is a uh, report, and, and I should mention, all the slides will also be accessible after today's presentation. We'll, we'll be sending out an email afterwards, and you, and you can actually click on that down there, and that'll take you to the report, um, but I'd also be more than happy to, uh, we'll see how well I can multitask. I'll, I'll try and find that link uh, for you and put it in the chat here as we keep making progress. Okay, Mary, what's another one that, that came out of the research? Well, we talked about this a bit, but um, let's look at the angle of trust. Again, it's, it's a critical relationship between the fundraiser and the, the leader of the organization. And I'd also say the board, because the leader of the organization reports to the board. Um, you must be able to trust each other. The fundraiser needs to be able to trust that they'll be taken seriously, that they will be heard, that they are doing their best work and are being supported. And the ED needs to know, needs to be able to trust that, that the person who is handling the fundraising is doing a good job, is representing the organization well, is out there and, and not sort of making things up or freelancing or representing the organization poorly. Trust is absolutely critical between these two positions and between the, the staff person and the board. And that, and that kind of brings to light for me, I know your next point here, expertise not being respected. And, and I obviously, I want you to speak to this, but it, it, the, the immediate question becomes, well, why isn't it? You know, and then and digging a few layers deep down there. So why? Why, why is there that lack of trust and, and lack of respect? I think part of it is people who don't understand fundraising, don't understand how difficult and complex it can be. Um, I think they draw connections to uh, salespeople in the corporate world. Um, and I've seen people hire corporate sales folks to be their fundraisers and expect them to just slide right in, be able to make it work, but it's not really the same thing. Um, it requires experience, it requires learning, to be really good at it, you have to treat it not as a job, but as a profession. And oftentimes that really, that really isn't understood across the organization. Um, sometimes I think we can be 
we can hurt ourselves with that because we're so good at putting a professional gloss over what we do that we might make it look easy and it's not it's not easy at all yeah no i i bits and pieces of that i i'm piecing together from experiences <laughs> that i've had with our clients and like i i see and can empathize and understand I mean, how you walk into an organization and, and or you hear people talking about what you do and, and just say, oh, well, they're the beggars. <laughs> no, <laughs> that's not it. That's not how it works. There's the art and the science. As there we is, know. and you need both. Yep. Uh, this is a problem, and, and I don't know why this happens. Maybe it's, it's insecurity. Um, maybe uh, a, a, an executive director has had a bad experience in the past, but your fundraisers need to have great relationships with board members and with other volunteers. You don't fundraise alone, never, never, never do. You need other people who are going to join you. Even, and I'm not saying other people will have to go out and ask for money, but fundraising is so much broader than just the ask and if you do all the other relationship stuff well the ask almost happens by itself right so when you're not allowed to be in touch with the board or other volunteers you can't do your job well i i one of the reasons one of the couple of reasons i left a job i had been at for 12 years was because the new ed maybe out of insecurity i don't know but decided that I was to have no more contact with the board, wasn't to go to board meetings, wasn't to be with the volunteers. She wanted to handle all of that. I couldn't do the work. <laughs> I couldn't do the work without my volunteers. She was gone in less than two years. I am still in touch with most of my board members. So it tells you how relationships <laughs> really work. Yeah, yeah, it really does. And, and also that you know, there could be that fear from someone who doesn't necessarily understand the role of a fundraiser within an organization. They really could look at, you know, someone whose title is gift officer or has anything to do with development and say, all they do is ask for money. So of course, I'm going to say, I don't want you to talk to our volunteers and scare them away or our board members <laughs> and scare them away. And I think that that kind of um, siloed nature of thinking about you know fundraising and programs or absolutely programs. that doesn't Silos matter. are death yeah. yeah they're they're the worst and then what i found really interesting is i was really digging into this you know reading in the uh, in the chronicle afp harris poll research you know this lack of trust being a major driver it reminded me of um, some research that google had done and, and what google had done was they looked at their teams. They studied teams within Google. And what you see up on the screen here, the one, two, three, four, five, these are the five key drivers of successful teams. And success being measured by most efficient, able to get things done, provide the biggest impact uh, to Google as an organization. And the first one there that you see is psychological safety. And for me, this concept of feeling safe to take risks and be vulnerable in front of each other, that's built off of trust, right? Like that, that whole idea that you can, you can go out on a limb and not feel insecure uh, or unsafe, uh, that's what leads teams to you know, get to the next few stages, dependability, structure, meaning, impact. Right. And, and this is even further reinforced. Um, there was an author, Patrick Lencioni, and, and he did a bunch of research as well. And this book here, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, was transformational for our for Market Smart, our business, our organization, every single person. After I read this book, uh, I had our CEO read this book, and I wanted to make sure that I wasn't just kind of going crazy thinking about, you know, this really hits home. We had every single person on our on our team read this book, Five Dysfunctions of a Team, and it, and it validates the, the Google research as well. And, yes. and the idea here is that you can't get to the top, you know, of this pyramid of, of successful team, uh, you know, execution without having all the other pillars, all the other pieces. And the first one is trust. So the first dysfunction that, that ruins uh, the capacity for teams to be efficient, effective, i.e. successful is not having trust and without trust you can't actually have conflict and without conflict you can't commit to things without committing to things you can't be held accountable and when there's no accountability there's no results right right the other thing is that that um 
creativity and trying things, experimenting is a big part of fundraising. And if you don't feel safe trying things, you'll just keep doing the same old, same old and getting at best the same old results. And even beyond fundraising, Mary, right? Like it's, it's just yeah. teamwork in general, because I remember there was a slide that I put in here that was really creative and out there. And, and you didn't make me feel psychologically unsafe with how bad it was. You gave me constructive feedback on it, but I'm only teasing, but, but seriously, you need, <laughs> you, need, you, need to, you, you need to have those creative moments and feel comfortable to express those things. And, you know, up until this point, we've really harped on, on negatives and, and yes, there were bright spots, which we'll get mm -hmm. to, but when you think about the environment that that development professional is in, this concept of psychological safety and trust, it's no wonder that was one of the major outcomes of the research. Yeah, oh, you know, and thinking about it, fundraising is also, you have to really put yourself out there. So you need to know you've got people at your back, you know? It's not, it's not easy to ask someone to give you money. It's not easy to go meet people you haven't met yet. It, it's, it, takes, it takes some courage to do that. So you need to know you have a team behind you. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and, and to your point, if you do just do the same thing over and over again, if you just sign the same purchase order to send out the same mailer and mm -hmm. expect something different, you know, and, and to convey that to your team, these are the hurdles that we empathize with. But that's why it's important to not sweep this under the rug, to, to read books like Five Dysfunctions of a Team or reference this Google research to really paint the picture that, you know, like these are these are the things that are leading to uh, us as as a profession and as as professionals, fundraisers leaving, and how we can try to start to address that. Yep, absolutely. So this gets compounded, doesn't it, Mary? <laughs> <laughs> it's a big one. So we're all poor and broke in the nonprofit world, um, and sometimes we have these sort of you know competitions to see who's more poor and more broke. Um, my friend Vu will joke about office chairs and how awful they are. Um, I, is, I don't know if any of you remember that Monty Python sketch where they're sort of, you know, um, kind of trying to compete about how tough their life has been. I wish I had it. I should have had a link to it, but it's very funny and it, it feels like what we do in the nonprofit world. But you must invest in fundraising if you want to make money. So you start with lousy salaries and crazy schedules where the ED is calling you at nine at night because she just thought of something she wants to tell you. And, you know, you're, you're, you've been in the, the, um, the profession for 20 years and you're making less than the kid down the street who's working at Starbucks, do you know? If we want good results, we've got to, to believe in ourselves and our staffs and treat them well and pay them well. Um, it doesn't have to be exorbitant, but that really is so much less a problem than the people who are not, not paying well at all. We've got to find a way to do it. That's got to be sort of what we, what we budget for first before we start um, wondering about that. Um, I remember telling an ED that she needed to cut programs if she wanted to keep the organization around. She absolutely refused, but she needed to if she wanted to keep the staff, the good staff she had, and she needed to look to them first. Investment in continuing education is important. How, how many of you pay for your own conferences or um, to view webinars like this on your own time because you're supposed to be working and this isn't working somehow? Um, we need to understand that this is a skill that needs to keep growing. You need to keep learning to be great at fundraising and organizations should budget for this. We have lots of opportunities to go learn more. We need to, we need to make that a priority too. And Mary, this, this bullet point in particular resonates with me more than others for, for quite a few reasons. There's analytical reasons, which again, foreshadowing will come up in a moment. But also on a personal level, my mom was a uh, school teacher, a special education teacher mm. at, in Baltimore City, okay, like the, the heart of Baltimore. And um, one of the things that she had to do, because she, she would go above and beyond, she was an awesome woman, she would buy her own materials for the class. Right, right. right. Yes. And that's not, that's not necessarily an apples to apples comparison here. No, it's similar. Conceptually, it's the same thing, right? It's, it's she, if she wants to go the extra mile and she wants her kids to succeed, she had to pay out of pocket. Well, 
we're asking then in, in the development profession, if we want professional development, we're going to either limit the budget there, the capacity there, or, you know, go figure it out on your own. And, and if you think about the end result for my mom, it was making sure that these kids that had special needs had a better day at school or, and, and obviously the case we're focusing here professionally, you know, making sure that we're raising more funds for our organizations. And we have some stats here in a minute that we're going to back this up with. Uh, it's a no brainer investment for the organization, but we see school districts not doing it and we see yes. nonprofit organizations not doing it. And it's mind boggling. Yes. Yeah. And these are professionals like your mom had, had to have more than a bachelor's degree. She needed an advanced degree to even be teaching that, but she's, you know, Temple University alum. Shout out to Temple right, University. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> oh, this is one that drives me bananas. Um, just because it's cheap or free doesn't mean it's good and it's going to work. So this is a, maybe one of the most critical investments you can make in an organization. Do not cheap out on this. Find the one that works for you. Um, I know people look at old ones that are cheap or things like Salesforce where they reel you in with, but it's free, but it's not free because you're going to have to pay consultants constantly to make it work for you. Spend the money, spend the time, find, this is, this is such an important piece of tech and you can't really fundraise well without this and you can't keep up donor relationships without this. So don't cheap out on this thing. <laughs> The Salesforce is free is Ugh. in my five years of being in this industry, probably the most frustrating sentence or statement I come across uh, week over week, but that's a different, that could be a whole right. other. <laughs> we'll do all right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You have to spend money to raise money. Uh, my favorite, really least favorite example for this is Email is free, so we're going to switch to all digital because that doesn't cost as much money as print. It also doesn't raise as much money as print. Direct mail brings in multitudes more gifts for most organizations than email will. And better yet is both together. But it, you got to look at the end result, not just the money you're laying out. Yeah, and I feel like in this particular um moment it's this concept of like looking for return on investment and almost being penny wise and pound foolish Absolutely. and you, you don't want to put yourself in that situation and and really to to focus on quantifying this and i think this should be pretty enlightening or, or insightful for our audiences there was research conducted um, a couple years ago dr adrian Sargent, uh, in conjunction with amy eisenstein and and, uh, and Dr. Uh, uh, Kotas as well. And one of the things that they found in their research, and this research study was about 630, 650 fundraising professionals that they engaged with. They found that each additional form of training, professional development training that the, the, the uh, fundraiser received was associated with $37,000 in additional income for the organization. Now, one caveat with this study was it was focusing on organizations that raised a million dollars or less each year, but still let that sink in for a moment. Even more so, I imagine they would scale for organizations raising even more, you know? You've got to think, you've got to think. And then you can juxtapose this with some of the, the data that came out of that Chronicle study, right? 61% of people who left fundraising jobs say they were dissatisfied with their access to leadership training. Okay, that's a, that's, you know, two thirds of people were frustrated with, with uh, <laughs> leadership training opportunities, interesting. And then a third are dissatisfied with their current, you know, uh, right. uh, capacity to get that training. But then we look at other research that says, if you give people that training, they're gonna make more money for your organization. Right. It's a win-win, right? You, you keep good people around, you raise more money, everybody knows better what they're doing, it's all good. And you can bring that you can bring that parallel right back to, to to my poor mom. She goes to Michael's and she buys some interactive stuff to make the lesson plan more engaging. The kids learn more, right? Right. But the, the funding isn't there. That acceptance from from people who don't necessarily understand why did we spend an extra I don't know thousand dollars on this professional development course? That's a thousand dollars lost. No, it's not. It's a thousand dollar investment right. in an individual that is quantitatively going to make you money in the future. 
And this is, I think, you know, when we think about building a case for support for different types of activities, it's referencing reports like these and, and being very thankful to the, to the firms and individuals and entities that conduct this research because it can help start to shift the conversation away from we can't spend that $1,000 to, well, what is that investment going to get us? And we can, we can pull up numbers like these. Right, exactly. And, and it ties back to that trust issue too. If you, if you trust your fundraiser to know what he or she is doing and to make wise choices about how to spend money on these things um, and to understand what the results of it will be, then, then you budget accordingly. However, as we continue on here, we <laughs> recognize, and we're almost through the negatives. I promise we're almost through the negatives. We recognize this, right, Mary? Absolutely. Um, I know it sounds sort of like a buzzword, right? Culture of philanthropy. It also sounds kind of fancy, but it really just, the key point about this is everyone in your organization is part of your mission and your mission includes fundraising. Philanthropy is why you exist. Otherwise, you wouldn't need fundraisers because you didn't you don't need to raise money. Everyone in the organization needs to buy into that. Does everyone need to turn into a fundraiser? Absolutely not. But everyone needs to think that way. That relationships and raising money is not something kind of icky. It's, it's all part of how you make your mission happen. And it is your mission. It is part of your mission. And I think in particular, you need folks that are in leadership positions, i.e. the board and yes. the chief executive. Um, you need them to be champions of that. And I think that's what this study highlights. And it's, it's not unknown to us, but it puts, again, quantifiable metric there. 36% of fundraisers are dissatisfied with the support from their boards. Another third are dissatisfied from the support they get from the CEO. And you can see that then play out, right, in, in this sure. way that we communicate with one another. Absolutely. No, there's a, that, that just makes it almost impossible to do your work well. Um, when, you're, when you're not seen as this integral part of the organization, like you mentioned, it, 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 it kind of you know, exacerbates this. Absolutely. Absolutely. You have to be, again, tying back to that trust, you have to be one of the people that the CEO and the board involve in any planning or important decisions about the organization because all of that will affect your job and because you will have information that they may not that will color how how you make the decisions you do um budgeting decisions staffing decisions uh program decisions uh, i know a lot of program people really feel sort of jealously guard that turf but you need to be part of that as i mentioned before if you can't fund this great new program you, or do you really want to set out and do it? At least set out and do it with open eyes then, that you're going to need to raise some more unrestricted money to make that happen. Um, yeah. The fundraiser has to be a partner at the very top levels of the organization. So these are all the pressures. These are all the, the <laughs> you know, I hate to say negative outcomes of the study, but really, you know, the eye-opening uh, underlying pieces of, of how you get that, that headline, right? 51% plan to leave their jobs. Let's talk about what it costs, because I think this is a really important um, uh, angle of conversation that a lot of people don't necessarily want to have, but it's really, um, you know, necessary, absolutely necessary for us to have a more informed conversation with some of the people that do just look at, you know, the, the bottom line. Absolutely. So, you know, that revolving door is not free. Um, donor relationships are a big, a big loss when someone leaves your organization. We're, we're human. We don't just make relationships with a position. We do it with, with a person. Absolutely. Uh, and so there's all sorts of research out there with regards to um, how much it costs when uh, someone leaves an organization. And there was this really compelling research that was done, uh, I think it was back in 2012, if I'm not mistaken, by the Center for American Progress. And you can see it's, it's linked down there uh, as well. And, and, it, and what they did was they broke out how much does it cost 
when we have to replace someone within our organization, so, so fill a role within our organization, broken down by how much someone's getting paid. And you can see here, for all cases, it says 21.4%. So 21.4% of that person's salary, essentially, or, or total earnings, um, is what it would cost. And that was really interesting, and that was very compelling. Now, the same research also made note of this line which says, and, and I'll read it you know, verbatim here, very highly paid jobs and those at the senior or executive levels tend to have disproportionately high turnover costs as a percentage of salary, 213%. And I think it was, I think it was Veritas Group, right, Mary, that wrote um, yeah. an article about this, which I think was very compelling. Uh, this idea that, you know, if you lose a, a senior fundraiser, uh, you're losing a lot in terms of how much it costs in salary. And then to your point, you're losing so much in terms of the relationships that have been built. So we can use 20%, we can use 213% and get totally different uh, kind of like hard numbers. Uh, but there is that other piece outside of the hard number, which, which we'll dive into a bit more here in a moment, which is the cost of all the relationships and rapport that has been built on behalf of your organization with people who want to leave their philanthropic impact through you. And that's really hard to calculate and also yeah. really uh, uh, valuable um, for an organization. So there are ways that we can try and calculate this. And there's other industry reports, and, and uh, this one came from, uh, I think it's called the Work Institute, a 2017 report they did that said 33% is kind of a reasonable benchmark. And that's what we're gonna use here for, for just a moment. You can go on myriad websites online and you can get um, you know, average salary uh, uh, amounts so that you can you know, be informed maybe when you're negotiating salary at an organization, things like that. You go to payscale.com, you don't enter in any type of geographic information, which we all know a major gift office or any position in, let's say, San Francisco or New York City is going to pay drastically different than maybe somewhere in uh, the middle of the country. But regardless, this is, this is uh, payscale data that was from a couple days ago, so very, very recent. It's around $69,000 is what they suggest is an average salary. So if we use our 33%, we can think about, okay, it costs an organization $23,000 every time they lose a frontline fundraiser. And that might not seem like a huge number. It might seem uh, uh, you know, too small, too big. It's that soft cost, that uncalculatable cost of what do we actually lose in terms of rapport, relationships, goodwill um, with those individuals that we've been cultivating or, or building relationships with. So there's this hard cost, and then there's also, of course, that, that soft cost, both uh, are incredibly, you know, uh, relevant for this conversation. Uh, one is easier to quote unquote, like itemize or look at, but they're both there. And, and, and we need to understand that as uh, professionals in this space, it's, it's expensive uh, and disruptive for our organizations yeah. to lose key members of our team. Okay, so how do we not lose key members of our team? What were some of the- Not goals? all bad news. <laughs> Come on, it's Halloween. We should we should have some treats here. Not not so many. Uh, not so much negative. So, hopefully, in my experience anyway, fundraisers are really driven by mission. You you, it's hard to fundraising for something that you don't believe in, right? You you join an organization because you can feel a connection to the mission. And it's hard to communicate a connection to a mission if it's not something you feel for, right? And fundraising is emotional, not mechanical. Um, and 93% of the people in the survey said that was so. They couldn't work for a charity if they didn't have a strong connection to the cause. That's a really good thing. That, that passion um, fuels really successful fundraising. And one of the things you said earlier, Mary, is, is, you know, not looking at fundraising as a job, but as a profession. And I think that same sentiment is kind of echoed through here where, like, we are professionals and we represent our organizations and we stand behind what they're doing. And we feel passionate by, by that. We're not coming into the office and just you know, you know, uh, sitting there doing nothing, like right. well, maybe, maybe 7%, but the other 93%, the vast majority, like we feel very empowered by the work that we're doing. And, and that's, um, you know, that's something that a lot of for-profit businesses, I'm sure we all have peers and friends who work at a company that, you know, 
sells fencing. You know, how, how excited <laughs> are you going to be about right. selling fencing? Even if the CEO of that company is trying to, you know, in an all staff meeting say, yeah, but our fencing keeps animals from running. I mean, you really can't connect those dots, but here with the, the work that we do, there's a lot of meaning behind it. Yeah. And, and that's a, that's one of the wonderful benefits of this sector, right? Of our jobs is we get to do something that actually really means something every day. We change I, people's lives. We, we help, we do really good stuff. And I hate to bring my mom up again, but I mean, it's the same thing with like yes. that education piece. You don't, you don't drive into Baltimore City and necessarily want to you know, do that every day unless you see the impact of your work, you feel connected to it. It's the same exact thing. Now, this one's interesting, and I, I want your take yeah. here, here, May, because we were talking before, right, about uh, you know, having the, the trust to really get out of the office and do your job and it not necessarily being there. But then we see that most people in this survey said they were satisfied with their travel schedule. So help me uh, walk me through this. I'm part. wondering if this was mostly, I mean, not every, not every fundraising person is actually traveling, right? Major gifts officers will be doing lots of travel, but most of the others, unless you have like a national organization, um, you're probably not really traveling a lot. So I found this kind of interesting, but from, and this is anecdotal, not, not data driven, but from all of the major gift officers I know, they kind of enjoy that time um, traveling. They're meeting with donors, which is why they do what they do and they love it. And they've got the freedom when they're on their own to, to run things the way they know it ought to be. So it, it, that might be part of that sort of feeling um, trusted and independent. Yeah, I think, I think that's, uh, that was my interpretation as well. So people who have families um, can find nonprofit work really difficult because too often there's this sense that any moment you're not spending on the mission, you're sort of being disloyal, but it doesn't work that way. Flexibility really makes all the difference to attracting the right people and keeping them. And flexibility doesn't mean you're going to get less good work done. Um, it just means you understand that work may not always happen on the nine to five or, you know, eight to seven that, that you're used to. Um, trust people, give them the opportunity to work from home when they need to. Make paid time off for family emergencies part of, again, part of those priorities when you're figuring out your, your budget. Um, treat your Treat your staff like they matter because they really do. And I found this one and then our next one here, this satisfied with their level of independence. I found this interesting because a lot of, you know, the negatives that we picked up on kind of suggest that this wouldn't have been as high. And it's interesting mm -hmm. because you, you think about, um, you know, feeling independent, feeling trusted and having the security to have flexibility or feel independent. It just, it, it seems almost, um, counterintuitive with, uh, you know, the really overarching findings of the study, but it is interesting to hear, you know, you ask people, you know, a thousand plus fundraisers to fill out this survey. There's a lot of negative things going on, but at the end of the day, they're saying, you know what, I am satisfied with how independent yeah. I am. Yeah, no, that's good. I'm glad. <laughs> maybe it's, maybe they're looking back at other experiences that weren't so happy. I don't know. It is interesting to see. It is yeah. interesting to see. Yeah. Volunteers are wonderful and they really can be such a like heart filling part of your work. Um, so I am not surprised at all um, to see this. Though the excluding board members part is a little troubling. Um, a bad board can really hurt. A great board can really help. Um, so there's, there's, a, there's a nugget in there that I, I don't have the data right at hand to, um, to unpack, but I'm glad people like their fundraisers. And I, think it, volunteers, rather. and I think it speaks to like that culture of philanthropy and it not necessarily existing at an organization. So maybe having access to volunteers or being involved with the program work of your, of your charity's mission, like that's the, the yes. aspect we're happy with, but then we're still frustrated that there isn't this culture of philanthropy or maybe that we're not, we don't have access to board members to facilitate relationship building. Like I can see this one a lot more clearly than the independence versus you know, some of the frustrations of, of. Well, you know, the other thing to keep in mind too, especially um, for leaders of an organization is volunteers are donors too. So fundraisers do need to know their volunteers. I, I've always found it so fascinating um, 
the amount of people that are involved in program work who aren't yep. even in the donor database, but then leave yes. a gift, you know, like, and They're it's giving it's, their time that that costs yeah. money for them. Yes. Absolutely. Absolutely. But it's how can we, how can we get rid of like that siloed nature? And, and it is good to see that a lot of fundraisers are happy with, you know, how yes. they are able to connect with their, with their volunteers. All right, Mary, so we've covered a lot. It's kind of crazy to think that we're almost <laughs> at the top of that hour. Um, we've learned why people leave, why people stay, how much it costs. Uh, why don't we kind of uh, uh, bring everything together here with- Yep, we'll go through this one pretty quickly because we kind of touched on all of these, but now we're going to flip it and here's, here's, the, here's the, what can you do to help things? Trust your staff, hire really good people and then let them do their work. Give them the education they need, give them the support they need, don't second guess them. Let people learn by making some mistakes. Experiment. Um, little, little thoughtful experiments, then share, share the results with everyone can really push your fundraising to the next level. Um, so trust. It really does come down to that. Trust and, and psychological safety. If you've taken right. anything away from right. this, it's maybe that phrase and, and, and either Google searching for that, that research or, or like, like I said before, you'll have access to these slides clicking on that link. Having that safety uh, within the workplace is really important. And then of course- I've this before, work-life balance. Um, so many people have, have children to care for or elderly parents or other, other parts of their life that, that are demanding for them. If you make somebody try to, to choose between their family and their work, you're probably going to lose. At least I hope you would. Um, so make it possible. There's, it's, really, it's really possible that people, people who feel like they're valued and who have that flexibility tend to work even harder um, than the ones who are sitting at home, you know, in the office panicking about who's going to be there when the kids are home from school. Um, make it possible. Absolutely. Absolutely. And then this was <laughs> probably the yeah, big takeaway from money, right? Let's do it. You're going to raise more money when you make that investment. Um, it's important. It's important. It's an important part of planning and budgeting. You have to spend money to make money. And even beyond that, there, there's another aspect here, which is just like each of us as individuals, we want to grow. We want to feel like we're learning, yes. evolving and developing. And when you, when you, you know, inhibit that, it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. And short-sighted. And short Cultural philanthropy. Everybody's in it together. Not everybody has to go solicit gifts, but everybody is part of that fundraising because philanthropy is your mission. Um, whether you're an animal organization or an arts organization or you're feeding hungry people, your mission First and foremost is philanthropy. You are about inviting other people to join you in this mission to give of their time and their money to make that mission happen. Philanthropy goes everywhere. So everyone gets cheers when you have a fundraising win. Everyone gets involved when you need things like stories or, or access to the program. All of that, everyone's in it together. And if you can make that happen at your organization, your fundraising will be so much more successful. And I think it's even like one step before making it happen is, is accepting that it's a positive thing. Yes. It's <laughs> not, don't belittle this idea that by asking for money, we are doing something that's not right. Like you've said a couple times here today, that's part of why your organization exists and, yep. and it is a core competency. Absolutely. So this is an awful position to be in and too, many, too often you find yourself here, you've got all the responsibility for raising X number of dollars this year, but you don't have enough authority. I'll give you one little small example at one organization. Um, the fundraising staff was not allowed to access the organization's email list because the marketing person was afraid if those people on the list were ever asked to give money, they'd unsubscribe. I'll give you a minute to just digest how stupid that was, right? I, I could one up you with anecdotes from <laughs> some experiences I've had. It's Kill the silos and give the fundraiser the authority that matches her responsibilities. Yeah, oh, man. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's almost as as frustrating as the Salesforce stuff, but we could we could do a whole another hour on those two things. <laughs> And don't expect miracles. Fundraisers are not there to save you and they can't make 
amazing things happen no matter how many times they're told that they can by the people who hope they will. They're real people, they're working hard, they need support psychologically and financially and emotionally, all of that. And they need time to make things happen. Give all of that to them and they will perform so much better for you and you'll have such a better organization for it. And as we're wrapping up here, uh, I know we're coming close to the top of the hour and we'll, we'll open up here for QA in, in just a second. This is not Mary and Zach just coming up with their list of you know, things they want to talk about and things that we think are important. We've poured through research. The Chronicle AFP Harris Insights that uh, came out just a couple months ago were really the impetus for wanting to talk about this, but there's so much out there. The underdeveloped resource, the, the research from Google, Lencioni's Five Dysfunctions of a Team, the Major Gifts um, uh, report from uh, Dr. Adrian Sargent and, and others. There's so much research out there, and, and, and that's where we're coming from here is that we can tap into that. You can tap into that. You can take these slides and, and try and form how you're going to have this conversation um, at your organization because it's a worthwhile one to have. And that's hopefully the picture that we've been able to paint here today. So I, I, I just kind of hopped out of the uh, uh, screen here so that the Q&A uh, would pop up on my end. Uh, I see we've got a couple things in here. Um, Eric, you've been very busy, so thank you. But Mary, any, any final thoughts before we address a question or two and then, and then let people have the time back in their day? No, take care of your fundraisers and they'll take care of you. Man, I feel like we should just end it right there. That's pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> so if you've joined us here today, thank you. Um, if you're listening to the recording, thank you for taking the time to, to listen through on that. Um, what we're going to do is we'll follow up via email and uh, we'll send out the uh, uh, slides as well so you can click through them, the recording as well. I, I, I do see this question here, Eric. I'm trying to read it and talk at the same time. Right. Always <laughs> uh, a dangerous Great question, game. Eric. <laughs> um, you know, off the top of my head, Eric, I, I, I don't have the, the numbers in front of me, but the best investment usually is a major gifts officer um, as far as return on, on that investment. Uh, so if you could only hire one person, someone with that skill might make sense, but every organization is different. If they have a humongous mailing list, um, then maybe you want someone who's great at, at that sort of direct response stuff to make the most of that. But um, dollar for dollar, I remember reading that a major gifts officer is, is the most um, fruitful investment. Great, great. Okay, Mary, I think we hit the, uh, uh, the hour right on top here. I, I, did. <laughs> I guess we've done our job. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much for coming and spending a little time with us. Um, and you've got our contact info there. I'm perfectly happy to answer any questions if you, if you want to shoot me an email. Yes, likewise, uh, we're resources here and uh, we'll get the uh, recording and, and information sent out shortly. Mary, that was fun. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a good day. Happy Halloween. Bye-bye. <laughs> Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.